Good evening. Welcome um, to Policy Exchange. If we've not met, my name is Richard Eakins. I'm a professor of law at the University of Oxford, and for the past four and a half years, I've also led Policy Exchange's Judicial Power Project. The point of the project, as many of you will know, is to consider some of the ways in which the expansion of judicial power may put in doubt the balance of the Westminster Constitution. And so the recent prorogation litigation has been of considerable interest to me and to uh, my colleagues. Uh, I've published a number of um, uh, points of commentary on the, the litigation and judgment. And in addition to uh, John Finnis's critique of the judgment, which some of you may have seen, the project has also recently convened an online symposium centering on the judgment, featuring contributions from 15 different colleagues across the UK and the wider common law world, 15 to date, I should add including Professors Alison Young, Anne Twomey, uh, Nick Barber, Aileen McCarg, Paul Yowell, Stephen Tierney, and Catherine Bernard. Uh, some of you will recognize, the, recognize those names, and as they uh, will suggest to you, the symposium includes, uh, by design, a wide range of views. It includes both some uh, spirited defenses and some forensic critiques of the judgment, as well as wider exploration of the implications of the judgment for constitutional adjudication and the future of our constitution. And if you're interested, that's all available on the Policy Exchange and Judicial Power Project websites, and I commend it to you. And we're also pleased uh, today to uh, publish a new paper on the judgment by Professor Martin Lachlan of the London School of Economics, and a hard copy, I can see them all across the room, uh, and there's some available at the door as well. The paper's a critique of the judgment, framed as if it were an appeal to an imaginary high court, and I should stress that, uh, uh, and that device is being used to isolate and to discuss what Professor Lachlan thinks are the Supreme Court's missteps. And I hope you'll find it an engaging read, even if you disagree with the analysis. Well, the point of this evening's um, uh, meeting is to debate the Supreme Court's prorogation judgment. With that in mind, we invited a panel uh, with a range of different views on the judgment's merits, and I'm extremely grateful to each member of the panel for agreeing to speak with us tonight. Let me introduce them to you uh, briefly. Uh, in order across the, uh, my right, your left, uh, Jonathan Sumption, who served as Supreme Court Justice from 2012 to 2018. Many of you will have listened to his excellent wreath lectures earlier this year, and I understand they've now been published in slightly expanded form as Trials of the State? Right. Very good. Uh, to his right, John Larkin, QC, who's been Attorney General for Northern Ireland since 2010 which I think makes him the longest serving law officer in the United Kingdom, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, he very kindly contributed to the online symposium we recently um, convened, which I mentioned. And every year in Belfast, he runs an excellent constitutional law summer school uh, featuring um, visiting Supreme Court Justice and other, um, other contributors. Uh, Helen Mountfield QC, distinguished public law barrister at Matrix Chambers. She appeared in the first Miller litigation, uh, although not for Gina Miller, um, uh, for another party, and serves as principal of Mansfield College. And finally, uh, Patrick Lawrence QC, distinguished barrister at four New Square Chambers, and a member of the House of Lords uh, sitting with the crossbench peers since October 2015. I've asked our speakers to address us um, in the order uh, you see here, each for about six minutes, after which we will have some time for discussion. So without further ado, let me invite Lord Sumption to um, start us off. Uh, I have been uh, a persistent and vocal criticism uh, of the tendency of the courts to appropriate to themselves um, uh, issues which properly, in my view, belong to Parliament or to ministers answerable to Parliament. That is the reason why I wholeheartedly approve uh, of judicial intervention such as we have seen from the recent Supreme Court decision, whose object is to conserve the authority of Parliament and the principle of ministerial responsibility, both of which seem to me to be fundamental to our Constitution. I think it's fair to say that before the Supreme Court decision, uh, most lawyers would have advised the government in the same way as the Attorney General apparently did advise them, that the relations between the Crown and Parliament are governed by political conventions and not by law. Uh, the problem is, with any, as with any proposition of this kind, uh, 
if the government does something sufficiently outrageous, then you must expect judges to wish to push the limits out, uh, and that is exactly what happened in this case. Uh, I want to briefly explain why, in my view, this development was necessary and right and consistent with basic legal principle. I think one has to start by looking at the constitutional background, which largely is a matter of convention. We are a parliamentary democracy. Unlike the position in, for example, the United States, the government is not directly elected. It holds office and is able uh, to carry through its program uh, only by the sufferance of parliament and by virtue of commanding a majority in the House of Commons. The convention is that the prerogative powers of the Crown are exercised by ministers. But the basis of that convention is that ministers have a majority in the House of Commons. That is, as it seems to me, the only basis on which the exercise of the powers in question is consistent with basic democratic principle. The test of whether the government does command a majority cannot simply depend on whether there has been a successful motion of no confidence. It must also, the government must also be able to get its business through. If it can't, because of parliamentary opposition, it plainly does not command a majority in the House of Commons. The suspension of parliament at a time uh, when the effect uh, will be uh, uh, to free ministers from parliamentary control is essentially, for those reasons, a constitutional abuse. It removes the sole basis on which it is justifiable for ministers to remain in office and to exercise power. Now, turning to the legal position, I would put forward three basic propositions. The first uh, is that uh, although political conventions are not justiciable, the fact that there is a political convention on a particular subject does not mean that there cannot also be a rule of law. Secondly, the exercise of prerogative powers by ministers on behalf of the Crown has been judicially reviewable since the GCHQ case of 1984, if not earlier. So the concept that this is an area in which the courts may sometimes think it right to tread is a familiar one. Uh, thirdly, uh, the law has never accepted since the beginning of the 17th century that a public power can be exercised by ministers without their being answerable for that exercise to anybody at all. Yet that would have been the position if Parliament were suspended at a critical time for public decision-making and the government's argument before the Supreme Court had been accepted. The whole, it, that, there would, on that basis, have been no political responsibility to Parliament because it would not have been sitting. There would have been no legal responsibility to the courts it, on the hypothesis that the government was right in its submissions. Theoretically, uh, ministers would have been responsible only to the monarch for the exercise of her powers, uh, but since, by convention, the monarch is required to act on minister's advice, that would effectively have been uh, a responsibility to nobody. Uh, that has never been regarded as an acceptable state of affairs by the courts. The courts have certainly accepted that there are major areas of decision-making for which ministers are answerable politically, but it is no good saying that something is a matter for uh, decision in accordance with a political convention if the government proceeds to kick away the relevant convention and to remove the mechanism for making that answerability a reality. Uh, if you prorogue parliament, that is tantamount to saying that there is no responsibility to anybody and that is a proposition which has not been accepted for a very long time, even if the particular form uh, in which it surfaced uh, in, uh, in September of this year was unusual. Now, I don't think it's an answer to any of this to say uh, that the uh, ministers will have to pay a heavy political price when the Parliament comes back from its prorogation 
uh, the price uh, will be heavy only uh, if uh, ministers would not have had Parliament's approval for what they did in Parliament's absence. And on that footing, one asks why in a parliamentary democracy should they be allowed to do it at all? And that is quite apart from the consideration, perhaps peculiar, to the unusual facts of the present case, that it would probably have been too late. Uh, in summary, I think that the Supreme Court decision is a welcome reaffirmation of the centrality of Parliament as the dominant element in our Constitution. Uh, it is certainly radical in its reasoning, but it is conservative in its effect, uh, because its effect is to reinstate Parliament as a matter of law in a position which it had always occupied as a matter of convention and should have occupied uh, in this instance. Uh, Richard was, was kind enough to refer to our uh, constitutional law summer school. Uh, our keynote speaker this year was a former colleague uh, of Lord Samson's, um, Lord Lloyd-Jones, who had also been a colleague of his in, in Brick Court. And uh, he, he explained to me that when they were colleagues in Brick Court, he would, and on the rare occasions when they were um, forensically opposed to one another, he would, having constructed his own position, sort of sit back and, and uh, be overwhelmed by the persuasiveness um, of uh, what Lord Sumption uh, was saying on the other side. Uh, I have an insight uh, into uh, what he meant. So let me hasten to agree um, on one issue with Lord Sumption. Um, this is a revolution. It is a conservative revolution because the uh, circumstances which led uh, to it um, and occasioned it are unlikely, one imagines, uh, to be seen soon again. Let me, um, using the touchstones of a couple of names, um, summarize some points. Uh, I want to start with uh, uh, Michael Howard, who I had very much hoped uh, would be uh, here today. Uh, I want to um, touch on two Lord Reeds, and I want to conclude, uh, as I've begun, uh, with Lord Sumption. When I was a um, junior in private practice um, during the 90s, um, it was a fair bit of my work uh, to be involved in challenges to the decisions of the then Home Secretary, Michael Howard, uh, when he refused to permanently transfer Republican prisoners, then housed in English prisons, uh, to Northern Ireland. Um, and the experience of doing those cases uh, over several years, um, both against uh, decisions of Michael Howard and his successors, uh, drew my attention to something, uh, and I'm still not quite sure what it is. Um, just as the um, sunflower um, makes no conscious decision to rotate uh, in the direction of the sun, so th there is sometimes a sense in the judicial branch of government uh, that there is a weakness uh, in the executive branch. And that's certainly the case um, in my own entirely unscientific survey with respect to prisoner transfer cases, cases which I could not conceivably have won. Um, in the early part, um, w w when the uh, Conservative administration at that time was um, possessed still of considerable power, uh, I couldn't lose towards the end when it became clear that a general election was merely months away and that the fortunes of that administration uh, were, to put it mildly, not very good. First general point. Um, the first Lord Reid, um, R-E-I-D, one of the great um, common law judges of the House of Lords. Um, in the context of the declaratory theory of a common law, there's two meanings. One, that the office of judge is to declare, tell us what the law is, rather than to give us the law. Um, Lord Reid, uh, at the time, I imagine, shocked quite a few people when extrajudicially he said, uh, well, that's a fairy tale, and uh, we don't believe in fairy tales anymore. And then let's fast forward a little um, to uh, the current Deputy President uh, of the Supreme Court who has openly, in the Unison case, for example, uh, used language that charged the common law made by the judges themselves. 
and the, the common law is now in a state of some plasticity. It's avowedly made by judges. Um, and there appears to be no um, limit, at least no limit ascertainable in advance to the judicial lawmaking power. It's safe to say only that it's obviously trammeled um, where appropriate by statute. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think, a matter of concern because those of us who, who would be concerned in the ordinary way with retrospective legislation taking away rights um, aren't conscious of the same clamour um, with respect to judicial lawmaking, which again, because of the other aspect of the declaration theory of the common law, is quite capable of taking rights away. And when I look at the decision uh, in Miller number two, my core concern is not so much the extreme circumstances in which this decision arose, one understands those, uh, but the creation of a standard. It's not, as Lord Sumption has said, that the prerogative can't be reviewed. It can be, but rarely, and never in this context before. M my objection is to the standard that has been created um, essentially from nothing. Uh, and I conclude um, with Lord Sumption, um, a document which should be compulsory viewing for all law students, uh, certainly for all students of public law, is Lord Sumption's uh, valedictory address um, in the Supreme Court. Um, and during the course of that, uh, he offered a, um, I suppose, the, the, the equivalent of the Enigma code breaker. He offered a, to translate um, some uh, judicial boilerplate. And uh, so various phrases trotted out. Um, the never say never, we can do what we like next year. Uh, I think the only um, definite negative was, um, is that in your printed case? And I hope I don't hear that tomorrow, which is uh, perhaps we can't do what we like. But the overall um, translation for so many phrases was, we can do what we like. And I think that's wrong. Well, I met Richard um, the day after, I think the day after um, the Miller number no. two uh, judgment. Uh, we were locked together in a padded cell with no windows um, by the BBC. And we were talking um, about the Miller case and then he asked me to give this talk. So I was very pleased to be invited here because I like to talk um, across boundaries. But um, I must admit to some trepidation um, because this is an event held under the auspices of the Judicial Power Project, which has a very clear um, take on uh, the question of judicial power, the extent of judicial power. And I strongly disagree with the proposition um, that in practice we have an excess of uh, judicial um, power in this country um, as, it is, um, as it is used by our higher judiciary. And I um, deprecate political events uh, political att attempts to um, take somewhat nuanced um, views expressed by people like Richard Eakins and Lord Sumption um, and use them in a way which delegitimizes what I regard as proper exercise of judicial power in a um, democracy. Um, in my view, um, the th threat uh, to a democratic society in which individuals continue to enjoy uh, the protection of the rights which are conferred by the common law or indeed by um, legislation uh, is the, um, exec uh, 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 the um, excess of executive power. Um, and so I think it's dangerous um, to uh, criticize the process of judicial decision making, although of course reasonable people can disagree on whether judges have got the line right in individual cases. The second reason I had some trepidation in coming here was that I looked um, at the policy exchange website as you do in preparation for coming here. And um, they had exam 10 examples of recent high caliber speakers who'd been to speak here. Um, and they were all men. So I felt some sort of feminist duty to say something high caliber. Um, and, I, and I have to say that I'm not sure 
um, that I can really, because um, I uh, think um, that the Miller number two uh, judgment is an entirely orthodox one. It's a very neat restatement of the law. Of course, it's legally important, and of course, it's politically important given the context in which that decision was given. But I think what the judges do is restate some very well-established principles of um, public law and constitutional law um, that um, in a democratic society um, in which parliament is accountable, parliament is sovereign, and the executive is accountable to parliament and in which uh, the courts ultimately decide what the law is. Um, the decision that the uh, prime minister had chosen to act in a way for which he lacked, um, for, um, lacked prerogative power in advising the Queen as he did strikes me as an entirely orthodox judgment. The first question um, that the court asked itself was whether the um, issue of law, whether the use of prerogative in this way was justiciable at all. And the Supreme Court said something which I think is an important um, parameter to this debate, uh, namely that the fact that an executive decision arises in a political context does not men render the matter uh, none um, justiciable. And I think that is an Im important restatement of an orthodox principle of law, namely that the scope of the law is ultimately determined by the courts. Now, of course, when something is politically controversial um, and when there are a number of factors that can be taken into account, it is very important that courts recognize that in a parliamentary democracy where parliament is ultimately sovereign, they draw back and they defer to the judgments of the primary decision makers because they are the people with the democratic legitimacy to make those primary judgments. And on that, I am very much with um, Lord Sumption. But it is not legitimate use of executive power to purport to determine uh, the limits of the law. And I think it's dangerous to democracy if members of the executive purport to disagree with lawmakers on what the limits of the law are, even if they don't like um, the decision. <clears throat> the second reason that it's been said that um, the court made a mistake in um, deciding to look at the ambit of the prerogative here um, is uh, that the Prime Minister and the government are accountable to Parliament. And I think that's also a red herring. In practical terms, um, the Parliament could not or have prevented the prorogation, or even if it might have done um, in these circumstances, if, if it had acted um, very swiftly. It's an important point of principle to say that since what's challenged is the advice to the Queen, which triggers an order in Council, which triggers um, actions uh, in Parliament, um, really what's happening is not um, an action in Parliament, but um, um, an activity where um, what's happening is the government is preventing itself from being accountable to Parliament. Um, but also, I think there's a wider principle which the court um, articulated and I think is also an important principle, which is that legal accountability and parliamentary accountability are not alternatives. They are both um, relevant um, in a democracy governed by law. And insofar as policy choices within the law are concerned, mm. and then parliamentary um, accountability is much more important. But legal accountability mm -hmm. is essential for the equal protection of the laws which exist, which I again hold is, is, is a very important part of a democracy properly um, defined, if you only have political accountability um, to fall back on when the executive misuses its power, then if you have a minority of power, um, you cannot enforce um, the law in that way or misuse of the law in that way. And I think that was an important general um, point of principle. The court then went on to say, given that this is a question on which they could properly form a view and the ambit of the law, they went on to consider whether the exercise of the power to advise the Queen by the Prime Minister um, had been an unlawful one um, and concluded that it was because the effect of the um, very lengthy prorogation in the circumstances in which it was made was um, to stop the... Um, the, the legislature um, and the um, branch of government to which the executive is accountable from performing its functions, potentially of legislating, if that's what it wanted to do, but in any event, holding the executive to account. Um, and that, again, 
strikes me as an entirely orthodox thing for the court to have done, to have asked whether the Prime Minister's advice trespassed beyond the limits of the law um, and to conclude uh, that it did. Really, the judgment is it, beautifully concise, um, but um, really you only need to read two paragraphs of the judgment, paragraphs 55 and 56, in which the judges ask themselves whether the Prime Minister's actions in purporting to prorogue Parliament for five of the eight sitting weeks before um, exit day, the 31st of October, had the effect of frustrating or preventing Parliament from performing its constitutional role, which was holding the government to account, and they said, of course it did. And do I think that that unanimous conclusion was right? Of course it was. I think that Richard aims for, for uh, balance on these, uh, on these occasions, and he's going to get it unless he provides a casting vote, because <laughs> I, 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 I don't think it was an orthodox decision, and I don't think it was a correct decision. In order to, to understand what is wrong with this judgment, and I think there are things that are seriously wrong with this judgment, it's necessary to start with, with a quite technical and rather fiddly distinction, but one that is completely central to the judgment. It's a distinction at paragraph 35 which the court draws between two different issues. The first issue, call it issue A, involves defining the scope of the power in question, here the power to prorogue. In examining this issue, the court is, if you like, marking out the boundaries of the power and then patrolling the boundaries. Anyone who purports to exercise the power when outside the boundary will be acting unlawfully by definition. And there is then no issue as to justiciability. That's clearly correct. If the court comes to that finding, it, it will simply say, um, this person purported to exercise the power, but he, he did not have the power, uh, and it's our duty to declare that that was unlawful. The second issue, call it issue B, is different. It involves policing the way the power is exercised. This involves the court accepting that the power has been exercised within its scope, but then evaluating a challenge to the exercise of the power on familiar J.R. grounds, irrationality, improper purpose, and so forth. The critical importance of this distinction for the purposes of the uh, Miller II case, obviously, as I've indicated, is that there is no issue, everyone agrees, there's no issue as to justiciability if one is in the territory of issue A. But there is a big issue as to justiciability if one is in the territory of issue B. And there is a particularly big issue as to whether the court should intervene and can intervene where the context is political. Now, uh, I, I think everyone in this room will be very familiar with the principle that, generally speaking, judges should not trespass on political terrain. Obviously, there are exceptions, and the fact that a case is, in some sense, political does not prevent the courts from intervening in itself. But there is, um, in a, 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 a lot of case law, which involves erecting a sign which says, no judicial trespassers here. It's not necessary to spend much time um, laboring this point, because the case law uh, on that um, matter can be, can be found um, cited and deployed very effectively, in, in, in my view, by the divisional court in um, their decision in Miller II, which was obviously not consistent with the Supreme Court's decision. Um, there are, I think, five or six cases um, involving dicta from judges such as Lord Diplock, uh, Lord Bingham, twice uh, Lord Hoffman supporting Lord, uh, uh, Lord Bingham, and the court accepting the submission of Mr. Sumption, Queen's Counsel, as he was in the Wheeler case, that there were no judicial standards by which the court could answer the question that arose in that case. So that principle is, is very well established, and the core, one of the core issues in Miller II was whether that principle was engaged by the facts of um, Miller II. Now, the no judicial trespassers principle was very dangerous for the claimants in Miller II. If one reads, as I'm sure most of you have, if not all of you, if one reads the decision of the divisional court, which exceptionally consisted of the Lord Chief Justice, the Master of the Rolls, and the President, one reading between the lines, one doesn't get the impression that that court had much problem with Miller too. They dismissed the claimant's um, claim essentially on the basis that this was a terrain on which the courts should not trespass, um, uh, uh, applying the principles in, in the cases that I've mentioned. 
the Supreme Court, when it came to consider the matter, took down the sign that I've mentioned, and it, it did so, um, I would respectfully suggest, by um, uh, formulating, first, by formulating a two-stage test which was to be applied to the, what I've called issue A, the scope of power um, issue, and, and you all, all have read that two-stage test. It involved first asking whether the exercise of the power frustrated or prevented the ability of Parliament to perform its constitutional functions. Call that the obstruction of Parliament issue. The answer to that question, uh, I would suggest, in just about every case involving the exercise of the power to prorogue, is yes, it does obstruct, uh, obstruct um, uh, the performance by Parliament of its uh, core functions. It has to, because it closes Parliament down, perhaps temporarily, but it's still an obstruction. The second stage of the test, obviously, uh, as we know, is to inquire whether there was reasonable justification for the exercise of the power. Now, the, the Supreme Court has treated this as what I'm calling an issue A point, namely marking out, delineating the boundaries within which the power can be lawfully exercised. But it has introduced into what it is treating as an issue A inquiry the concept of reasonable justification. And the concept of reasonable justification is an issue B point. It's all about the way in which the, uh, 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 the power is exercised. Um, so the thing is collapsed into one inquiry. The two issues are collapsed into one inquiry. It's quite a dry way of analyzing it. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to quote Professor Finnis. Some, some of you will have read his paper, which is on the, the website. I don't think I'd use his words, because unlike him, I, I harbor a faint hope that I might be briefed to appear in the Supreme Court at some point in the future. But, uh, but he put it in this way. Um, the judgment's first claim that the boundaries are legal was a judicial fiat, and now the second claim that the judgment merely patrols boundaries turns out to be a card shuffle, a fudge. So that's his view. Now, I want to move on briefly to consider the question whether the reasonable justification inquiry involves issues of political judgment which one might think would be caught by the no trespass sign that I am considering. It seems to me, I must say, obvious that it does, and it seemed obvious to the divisional court that that was so. Considerations included the fact that the Prime Minister left time in September and October for Parliament to consider the prorogation in the first place, and also to consider matters in the two-week period before um, exit day. It's notable that um, uh, Parliament in the period before prorogation did not take any step to, as it were, cancel prorogation, which it, it could have done with the uh, speaker's assistance. It instead proceeded otherwise in a very energetic way. Considerations also include the preparation of the Queen's speech, about which Sir John Major had quite a lot to say. Uh, the imminent conference season, the fact that, as, as one has observed in Parliament, Parliament has been doing very little useful work um, for the last six or 12 or even 18 months, apart from flailing around trying to implement Brexit or not trying to impl implement Brexit, according to your point of view. And critically, there was a further consideration, which was played down, in fact, made almost invisible by the Prime Minister in the presentation of his position. Um, but that was the factor, that was the possibility that five weeks parliamentary peace and quiet, uh, as it were, might be regarded as very valuable as the executive engaged in an incredibly demanding, very important 11th hour uh, treaty negotiation. And one, one can perhaps test the validity of these considerations by reference to the unhappy history of the last three years or so of um, Parliament engaging with the result of the referendum, and perhaps also with the fact that since Parliament was non-prorogued and um, came back to sit, there have been a few bad-tempered exchanges, but nothing much else of any value has been achieved. So, um, how did the Supreme Court address the fact that all these political considerations arguably were in play and might invoke the no trespass sign? What it said was, at paragraph 61, was having considered um, in, in an unkind way, but possibly a way that was fair, um, two or three random pieces of paper that were placed before it by the Prime Minister, it said it's impossible to conclude that there was any reason, let alone a good reason, for the Prime Minister doing what he did. Now, forensically, I don't do that much public law, it may be emerging from these random reflections, but I do a bit, but I do um, more law in the, in, 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 on the commercial side, and I'm very familiar with Judges who say, well, you haven't advanced a positive case on this. You haven't put in any evidence on this. The other side's case is very tenuous, but you've said nothing at all. Therefore, we can treat the point, we the judges can treat the point as closed down. And that's essentially what the Supreme Court did in Miller No. 2. But, but consider this, 
possibility. It didn't go that way, but consider this possibility. Suppose the Prime Minister had taken a different course. Suppose he had said, um, uh, documented it carefully, suppose he had said this, I took many factors into account, all those that I've mentioned in my brief summaries so far, and in particular I took into account that having given Parliament time to address the proposed prorogation and having made sure the Parliament had some time before the 31st of October, I made a political judgment that the interests of this country in getting a good Brexit outcome were best served uh, by proroguing for five weeks. That was my political judgment. Applying the extensive case law that I've alluded to, I, I, I suggest that it, in those circumstances it would have been quite impossible, it would be quite impossible, for a court to adjudicate properly on the reasonableness of that proposition. It simply couldn't do so. The, uh, the issues that arise in relation to that are simply much too intensely political. But the effect of Miller II, undoubtedly, subject to correction on my right in due course, the effect of Miller II is that had the Prime Minister run his case that way, the court would have had to have adjudicated on the um, uh, propriety of those, on the, on the relevance of those considerations, and might even have had to adjudicate on the very delicate question as to whether the Prime Minister was accurately representing um, uh, his um, uh, reasons for taking the decision he did. One, one last point, I'm, I'm overrunning, one last point. Prime Minister, Prime Minister didn't really put his case that way. There might have been all sorts of compelling political reasons why he did not. But there's one other possibility which um, it seems to me needs to be considered here. The Prime Minister, so far as one can tell from the written submissions and what one saw on the internet, the, 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 the Prime Minister and his advisers did not really seek to tackle head-on the reasonable justification test, which the Supreme Court has described, has set out in Miller II. There may be a reason for that, a good one. It may be that he and his advisers did not address that test and the formulation generally of the relevant test in Miller II because it had not yet been invented when they were making submissions to the court. And that rather mischievous thought prompts an inquiry, which I can't develop now, into whether this decision suffers from another fundamental, vitiating flaw, namely that it, it contains a strongly retrospective element which is contrary to the fundamental rule of law principle that the law should be certain and predictable. As, as Lord, Sump Lord Sumption has said, the Attorney General's advice that we can presume he gave to the Prime Minister, namely that the courts wouldn't touch this because it was, because it was not justiciable, represented the orthodoxy at the time. The Prime Minister has now been hauled over the coals, been called somebody who lied to the Queen and a criminal, etc., etc. But he was following properly given advice that was consistent with the law as, as it stood at the time that that advice was given. I find that, despite the fact I don't wish to defend the wisdom of the Prime Minister's decision to prorogue at all, as it happens, I find that um, a little bit troubling. Where will all this go? Um, where, where it will go, and I borrow here from um, Lord Sumption's recent um, fantastic lectures and, and, and the book of those, containing those lectures, it is travelling in the direction of a profusion of litigation being treated as politics by other means. The litigation will be fast-tracked, like these cases, and that's dangerous, because judges have to work in, in very compressed time periods. That can have bad results. The litigation will be brought for collateral political purposes. Not saying this litigation was brought for inappropriate collateral purposes, but it will happen. Uh, there will be the succulent, there, the succulent prospect of disclosure of documents, compelled disclosure of documents thought to be embarrassing to the political opponent, the compulsion of evidence, perhaps even the holy grail of cross-examination of a political opponent. And then, of course, the possibility of damaging judicial criticisms with the authority of the Supreme Court, which can be deployed um, to good effect um, politically. None of that, it seems to me, is at all desirable, and that, I think, is the direction on which this decision um, uh, uh, has placed us. There we are. I don't think it's a good decision. I'm going to pop back here to chair. I'm certainly not going to exercise a casting vote, uh, although I will thank you, Helen, for overcoming your trepidation and appearing. In fact, I think I may just give Jonathan Sumption and Helen Mountfield a minute if they wish to uh, comment on some of the arguments that have been made. Um, uh, it's a partial exculpation for my, my timekeeping. So, Jonathan, or...? Um, I think that the strongest point uh, which has just been made uh, is about the inherently political nature uh, of the reasonable justification test. Uh, 
Um, and that there, there are problems about that. I don't <coughs> deny that for a moment. But if I can just say <coughs> what I think about this. First of all, uh, I don't think it's fair to say that this is effectively retrospective legislation by judges. One would have expected the government uh, to put forward an explanation uh, of uh, the decision that was being challenged in any event. Uh, I don't think I can remember a single judicial review case in which I appeared as counsel or which I heard as a judge in the Supreme Court where there was not an official witness statement explaining the judgment. Uh, and uh, I presume uh, that this was because, as Dominic Grieve suggested in the House of Commons some weeks ago, no official could be found uh, <coughs> to put his name to a witness statement uh, which said that the reasons were those contained in Nicky da Costa's submission or in the Prime Minister's uh, circular letter to MPs. That is a very unusual state of affairs. Um, the, uh, the court did not in fact decide whether there was a reasonable justification because very unusually <coughs> the government did not put forward uh, an explanation. Um, uh, uh, it did not put forward the persuasive argument that has been ventilated uh, from my right. Um, uh, and uh, if it had done, I think a, lo a lot would depend on how this test is actually applied, something we don't really know. I would suspect that it would be applied on a, 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 a Wensbury basis, that the decision would, be, would pass, uh, provided that it was a view which could legitimately have been taken by a Prime Minister in this Prime Minister's position. Uh, but I think it is unsatisfactory uh, that the matter should rest there, and ultimately I think that the only uh, satisfactory solution is to have legislation which would either abolish the right of prorogation and simply leave it to a, a recess, which requires a, a motion in the House of Commons, uh, or else uh, would uh, apply the requirement uh, for a motion in the House of Commons to prorogation as well. Anything else? Well, the, 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 point, the point that Patrick made that I found most persuasive and troubling for my, for my um, general belief that this is a good judgment is the difficulty of identifying the line between the ambit of a power and whether um, the power has been misused outside the scope of its power or um, in, a, in an illegitimate way in a sort of broader Wednesday type sense. And I think um, the answer to that is that because this was a use of power that, w that uh, what was under examination was a use of power that trespassed on a constitutional principle, i.e. parliamentary sovereignty, then um, the really good reasons are needed to depart from that. And that's a quite established principle with Metric Martyr's case and others where you have something that is um, constitutionally protected then there must be good reasons articulated if you're going to depart from it and that's where I think the boundary is. Um, I've also heard a number of people say what would have happened would um, Boris Johnson have wrong-footed them if he'd said this was my purpose and I'm allowed to do that because I'm a politician and I make um, political judgments and maybe um, whether or not that would have worked for him politically um, maybe that might have worked better for him legally, but I'm not sure that it would have done, because at that point, I think um, the court would have said, um, well, on Padfield principles, you can't use a power beyond the ambit for which it's afforded. The power to prorogue is given to put parliamentary business in order, not to, not to shut up the legislature when they, they're getting in the way and saying annoying things. Um, and I think he probably would have lost on that basis. And I think the court was, in some senses, being polite by dodging the um, improper purpose question <laughs> and asking the improper effect um, question. Uh, in terms of litigation being brought for um, improper collateral political purposes, that is, of course, a danger with um, judicial review or indeed other things. Um, for example, um, the attempts to prosecute uh, the Prime Minister for the 350 million pound claim on the side of a bus, which is clearly something where people are going to hold him to account, they should hold him to account politically. Um, but I think the courts are astute to stop political use of law. My perception, having spent years trying to persuade courts um, to um, look at the uh, proportionality of various questions, is that they are very astute to stand back where they think that's the proper political thing to do. I don't think, in practical terms, we have a risk of the judiciary destabilizing our country by taking over 
and decisions that are properly within the ambit of the political class. Very good. Well, we should have um, uh, some questions from the floor, and I can see a host of hands. Uh, there's a gentleman here, and there's a microphone coming. <clears throat> we'll take about, yes, you, thank you. We're going to take about three at once. So if you can say who you are and ask a question briefly, it'd be most grateful. Thank you. Uh, John Balder. I'm uh, an educational consultant rather than a lawyer, and I share Lord Sumption's um, interest in history and the historical aspect of this going back to the first president of 1611, where it's very clearly. Um, indicates, you know, particularly with the pre-Civil War context of that, that this was an attempt to shut Parliament up. Having said that, and I agree that this judgment was of course right, I strongly agree uh, on the danger of um, uh, collateral um, litigation. And I'm afraid that I don't see the activities of matrix chambers as conducive to the public good in this respect. <laughs> Make a question if we can. There's a woman to, um, to the, my left there. Can I just clarify that <laughs> matrix chambers act both for and against the government? Barristers in matrix chambers because they're all on the camera. As, as, as do I. Or have I. Fair enough. Why, sir? Patricia Hodson. Um, I speak as a layperson. Um, and I was impressed, of course, by the panel... Uh, fixing what they had to say within the context of democracy. But I then heard them define democracy in terms of the accountability of the executive to parliament and the uh, uh, need for the courts to ensure that that happened. Nobody talked about the demos at all. Um, now we have a situation in which parliament both um, refuses to allow the executive to govern, but also refuses to allow a general election. And into that vacuum steps Miller and the Supreme Court. Now, um, uh, I'm not um, qualified to judge between uh, the two sides in how the court interpreted the law, but to those who are not judges, there is an overwhelming temptation to see the judgment in terms of sympathy for one side of the political argument. And I fear that as a result of that, the Supreme Court, which is a relatively recent invention, no longer has the authority and the judicial impartiality in which judges have always been held. Thank you. Uh, one more question for the surround uh, behind, uh, Lord Trimble. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, Trimble. Uh, it, it's not a question, it's, it's an observation. Uh, the failure of the government to put forward a coherent explanation as to why they were doing this, which was doted by uh, Mr. Sumption, uh, should have won alarm bells for them. Maybe the government didn't want to put in a proposal, maybe the government didn't, or those who were planning this, didn't want to win. Because what they intend to do is to run a political campaign on the basis of the establishment is against you and we are defending you, the, you, the attacks that the establishment are making on you. And uh, by this case, will in the end help the, the uh, uh, probably will help the, the, the campaign that I think is going to be launched. Well, who in our panel would like to take um, those? Shall I uh, answer? We'll go in order. Uh, Briefly, please, if we can, so we can... Um, uh, Hodson's observations. First of all, I do not think that democracy depends uh, uh, on having uh, elections uh, at intervals more frequent uh, than five years. We are almost unique in the world in having, before the Fixed-Term Parliament Act, uh, a rule which entitles the executive to decide when it would call a general election and have a new parliament. Uh, and it seems to me that was something that had very often been abused. And I don't really think that you can say that the parliament elected uh, in 2017 was not acting democratically simply because it decided not to have another election uh, in 2019. As to the suggestion that this was motivated uh, by sympathy for one side or the other of the Brexit um, case, uh, I think that is very unlikely. Um, I sat on the Miller number no. one case, uh, and I can assure you that views of judges uh, <coughs> about Brexit itself had absolutely no re uh, relationship with the question whether they were in the majority or were dissenting in that case. Uh, finally, the suggestion that this is 
a recent invention. The um, Supreme Court uh, is exactly the same as the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords, apart from an additional £26 million pounds a year in its budget. <laughs> uh, it has the same powers, the same procedures, the same attitudes. Uh, there is nothing that the Supreme Court has done since 2009 that would not, in my view, have been equally done by the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords in comparable circumstances. John. Um, Lord Trimble's um, point, I suppose, uh, is to attribute to government a Machiavellianism um, of which the Florentine would himself be proud. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, at this stage, I, I suppose that, that's, that's simply unknowable. Um, on elections, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious also that um, in, in, a, in a case of now uh, some antiquity, uh, Robinson against the Secretary of State, um, Her, Her Majesty's Attorney General uh, opposing uh, the appeal to the Supreme Court, put forward the proposition um, that an election in that Northern Ireland context was a nuclear option, um, w w which struck me as, as, as somewhat unfortunate. And I have to say that, that the present administration can't seem to govern. It, it doesn't command, as we know, a majority in the House of Commons. And were it not for the, um, the sharp edges of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, we would have a general election. And I, I think insofar as the 2011 Act is preventing that, then it's, it's a bad thing. Um, taking up what, um, uh, what Baroness Hodgson said about um, democracy, um, I agree with your assumption that there is more uh, to a democracy than elections every five years. Um, it required laws made by an elected um, uh, legislature, <coughs> um, but also an executive which is accountable to law, and, and I think it's particularly important, the ongoing equal protection um, of the law. I don't think there is such a thing as an illegal democracy that Victor Orban may think, and I think that um, the rule of law is a fundamental aspect of a democracy. Um, so I think it is a great shame, I think she may well be right, um, that many people saw um, the court, the Supreme Court, as telling the Prime Minister he was wrong. Um, on a point of policy, although they were at pains to emphasize that that was irrelevant. Um, I do think um, that process is important and that the idea of delegitimizing that process, as um, the government subsequently sought to do, is um, very um, dangerous. And to Lord Trimble's point, um, I, I think you, you, may, you may be right. I mean, you're, you're, the, you're the politician, not me. I, I, I don't know how, how people operate, but to the extent um, that um, either the judges are set up as enemies of the people or still more dangerous, Parliament is set up as the enemies of the people and somebody says, I am your friend and the people who are elected and the people whose job it is to set out the limits <coughs> of the law are your enemies or traitors, then we are in very dangerous territory and that's not a comment on the rights or wrongs of Brexit, it's a comment on how, our, uh, how people are respecting or not respecting the appropriate roles of the actors in our political process. <coughs> Um, very quickly, uh, I don't have Lord Sumption's privileged access to the thinking of the Supreme Court, but, but uh, certainly I, I, as a practitioner, I don't for one moment think this was a Remainer judgment. That, that really hasn't crossed my mind. But I do think that, I think, if anything, I think the judges were irritated in the way that judges sometimes get irritated by the way in which the government was presenting its case and by the rather sparse nature of the government's evidence, is my guess, uh, from what I saw on the, on the television. Um, but I agree with the questioner to, th to, to, to this extent. I do think there is a serious risk that a lot of people who are not lawyers around the country will harbor that suspicion. And that is very damaging in, in all sorts of ways. And as to Lord Trimble's very um, intriguing suggestion, I, I don't think myself that the government threw the case. They, they won hands down in the divisional court, and I think they expected to win in the Supreme Court. A handful more questions. Stephen Laws. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I have two observations which I shall try to make Short. shortly. Uh, the first is about the standard. I th think it's extremely difficult to see how a regular prorogation could satisfy a, a reasonable justification standard. Prorogations take place for basically four reasons. Uh, 
provide theatre of, of a Queen's speech. Uh, they kill off private members' bills that haven't reached the statute book. They provide a deadline for um, the, the House of Lords mainly to agree to government bills, uh, either agree to them or um, kill them, and the House of Lords will always agree. Uh, and in the case where the Parliament Act might be in uh, play, uh, they ensure that the Parliament Act can be resorted to if need be. I don't see how any of those, the normal reasons for prorogation, can satisfy this sort of uh, test. My second point is about um, the role of the Crown, because I, I, I think uh, I would uh, dissent from Lord Sumption's assertion that in this case the Queen was obliged to do what she uh, was asked to do. Um, the, um, and it's very delicate to talk about this, and we shouldn't, and neither should politicians. Uh, but there is evidence from around the Commonwealth that um, people in the Queen's position do uh, advise uh, on uh, what prorogations they will accept and what prorogations they won't accept. Uh, there is a reserve power. I was very struck when uh, Professor Anne Twomey was sitting between uh, Richard and Paul Craig at the um, PACAC uh, committee the other day, that she said that what she detected in the Supreme Court's judgment was the Supreme Court substituting itself for the Crown in the regulation of this sort of activity. Uh, and I think that's a bad thing because the cr yeah, that's not one point. Uh, the, the Crown in these cir circumstances provides an incentive for proper behavior. Politicians keep the Crown out of politics and uh, they therefore find political solutions to political problems. Uh, there is no similar incentive to keep the courts out of politics. Indeed, there's an incentive to involve them because they provide certain answers that can crush your opponent rather than requiring you to reach some sort of accommodation with them. The woman just in front, next row. Thank you. Juliette Samuel, I write for The Telegraph. And um, I wondered if uh, those in favor of the judgment could elaborate on what you think the exceptional circumstances were in constitutional terms that justify this. Because um, as, as one of the other speakers said, there has been, um, since Parliament was brought back, nothing's actually happened. It hasn't done anything. There's been absolutely no uh, legal change to the situation. And it was given time before and after to, to collapse the government if it wanted to. And so I wonder what the exceptional circumstances are that justify this supposedly unique uh, uh, ruling, which actually will have loads of repercussions into other areas and has thrown much of the Constitution, or, uh, put a big hole in a chunk of the Constitution. Time for one more question. There's a gentleman further back there, if you may. The glasses, thank you. Uh, Ian Johnston with Evening Standard. Um, the suggested by Helen Maltfield the Supreme Court was being polite by pursuing the uh, uh, improper effect motive. Had it pursued the improper motive, sorry, improper effect, had it pursued improper motive, do you feel it would have found likewise that the action was uh, illegal? And um, would it have found that the PM did indeed lie to the Queen? Take that in, um, in order again, uh, whichever combination you wish, briefly please. Um, the role of the Crown, I think this is a problem. We have a hereditary monarchy uh, which uh, does not wish to be involved in politics uh, and has progressively withdrawn from the actual exercise of its reserve powers over the last 15 years or so, with the result that we do not have a head of state capable of operating as a constitutional arbiter. Um, the position is somewhat different in Commonwealth countries like Canada and Tasmania, where similar problems have in the past arisen, where uh, the, the Queen's powers are exercised by a Governor General who is almost invariably a, a politician and is certainly removable. I think that there is an urgent need to ensure that the Queen has a source of advice independent of the government on constitutional issues uh, from privy councillors who are qualified to give that advice. As to the point about exceptional circumstances, I think the exceptional circumstance, and it's very exceptional indeed, is that on the 31st of October, as matters presently stand, a major change in our arrangements as, as a country will occur, not by positive decision, but by nothing happening. Uh, and therefore, there was a premium from the government's point of view uh, on ensuring that as little as possible happened in September uh, and October uh, of this year. That is an extremely unusual state of affairs. Now, it's perfectly true to say that 
that Parliament was given time to do various things. Uh, but uh, the, the reality is that if the government's submissions had been accepted, it wouldn't have had to give Parliament any time whatever to do that. It could have prorogued uh, with effect from uh, 9 o'clock in the morning uh, on the 3rd of September. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I'm not persuaded by that point at all. At least one of the questions was directed primarily towards those who were enthusiasts um, for the judgment, uh, and I have a, um, a measure of scepticism. Um, we've undoubtedly seen in the last uh, 20 years um, a huge shift in um, the identity of the guardians of the Constitution. Um, Blackstone uses the phrase guardians of the Constitution. Uh, and he means members of parliament. Um, uh, I s venture to suggest that if you were to float that as a proposition now, it would be met perhaps with some mirth. But actually, Blackstone's right, um, and I think we need to recover that sense that the primary guardians of the Constitution are parliamentarians. Um, courts plainly have an enormously important role to play in the things which courts can only do but looking after the Constitution is uh, primarily a, a matter for Parliament and, and indeed for, for demos. Um, well, I agree with Lord Sumption that the, w there were exceptional political circumstances in play, which is what triggered the prorogation in the first place and the need for it to go to court. And it was exceptional in that sense. And the Supreme Court said, we doubt this will ever happen um, again. Um, and that made the um, consequences of Parliament not sitting for all that period particularly acute. Um, but I don't think that these were, as I've tried to explain, exceptional applications of the law. I think they go back to 1611 and the way the common law is developed. And I don't think any one of the principles that they applied was um, an exceptional one or very much um, pushing um, at the lines. And the fact that um, no legislation has gone through doesn't mean to say nothing's gone on in Parliament. It is really important to scrutinise all this very complex secondary legislation and so on that may need to go through um, if we're going to leave on time. So what happens when you do give Parliament the opportunity that the Constitution says they should have as the guardians, primary, primary guardians of the Constitution is quite important whether or not they then seize it. Um, as to what would have happened if um, the court had not um, looked at the effect prorogation and concluded that that was um, unconstitutional and improper and so therefore it didn't need to look at improper purpose. Um, I don't know. I, I, I always felt confident that the court would hold that this was a justiciable question. Not having looked in, ev in great detail at the evidence in the case, I didn't know it would have been a very big step to say that the Prime Minister acted for um, an improper um, purpose. But given um, that this obviously did prejudice on fairly fundamental right, then it seems to be the government to put forward evidence of its purpose. And I don't think there's any evidence of a proper purpose and quite a lot of evidence of these chaps for very improper purposes. So I, I don't know what they would have done, but I think they were probably what I meant was I don't mean mean they were cheating. I mean they were probably quite glad they didn't have to address that because that would have dragged them much further into political controversy. And I really do think that judges are properly reluctant to do that unless to the extent that they're required to do so by the point of their function. Thank you. Um, the, the, the current situation is, is, is certainly very challenging and exceptional in some ways, but I'm not myself persuaded that it is exceptional in the constitutional sense. Parliament, whose sovereignty Miller II and, for that matter, Miller I uh, were both designed to protect, um, has legislated for exit, um, first of all in the Notification Act, which was, of course, pursuant to Miller I, uh, and was on the premise that notification would inexorably lead to exit and then in the Withdrawal Act, and, and exit must follow uh, unless there is a, a further act such as revocation. So that's going to happen. It may be economically disastrous, I don't know, but it, it, it's going to happen pursuant to par legislation that Parliament has passed. What is um, constitutionally, what may prove to be constitutionally exceptional over the next 7 to 14 days is the Ben Act, which is defectively drafted, in my opinion, and may well give rise to very challenging constitutional issues, which will have to go back to the courts. But that's the subject for a different day. <laughs> With that tantalizing note, uh, please join me in thanking our panel for a very stimulating discussion.